be perfect. Just spin your pitches and have confidence in that at the end of the day. Mackenzie Donahue will lead off the shortstop for Tennessee. The power T has been power hitting so far this year. Donahue, the senior, only five foot three, transfer out of Oklahoma. You might remember that name from the 2021 Women's College World Series. Tore it up, 476 average, 10 ribbies, three homers. Hit the three run homer against UCLA, had a multi home run game. Battled some injuries last year at Oklahoma, now a Tennessee volunteer. Let's get it going between the Bulls and the Lady Balls. First pitch is down below, ball one from Nori. And what a leadoff to have, batting 524 as your leadoff hitter. That shows you the confidence they have, and she's very selective in the pitches that she's going to go after. Fine, so Zion levels it one and one. Was talking with Gabriella Nori after the FGCU game the other day and asked her, you know, what kind of changed for her. And she said getting more comfortable. It's hard as a transfer, I think, coming into a new program and trying to find your rhythm. Ball on a strike, pitch to the righty. And that misses just up top two and one. Not only new, new rhythm, but you have new teammates. So there's a different expectation that you have going out there. Now you got to prove yourself again. Not necessarily like you have anything to prove, but as a pitcher and when you're competitive, you want to prove to your teammates you can do this. Donahue takes a strike, two and two. She added a change in the offseason, already had a rise in a backdoor curve, but Allison, you love a good change, and it's really not something that she got comfortable with until about a week ago. And it's a perfect time to utilize this against Tennessee. You've got to mix up the eye levels of the rise, the curve, and then off speed with the changeup. Wave and a miss, and Gabrielle and Nori strikes out Donahue. Good start for number 27 in green. She's doing, she's doing a great job locating her curveball. This one is just a little bit up in the zone, but gets her gets Donahue to swing after that, which is great, and how you want to start off this inning. One of the big stars for Tennessee coming off a three for three game, Kiki Malloy. 143 career starts, including the one today, and she's down 0-1. Coach Weekly said she is one of the most exciting players in the game, and that is certainly coming to fruition again. This is actually her first game this season not hitting in the leadoff spot. Last week had three multi-hit games, seven extra base hits, including four home runs. Fans threw it down 0-2. And, and I'd like to say this is a different Nori that we've seen in the past. She's really getting ahead, spinning her curveball and keeping it on the corners. When she gets into trouble, she's not hitting those zones. And you see right there just on the inside part of the plate. Two strike pitch to Malloy. Malloy pops into the air, and that is not playable. Humplick watched that sail to the top of the press box. We'll do the 0-2 again. Kiki Malloy, USA Softball National Player of the Year watch list, all conference in the preseason. Comes in with a lot of expectations this year, and so far she's been living up to the hype. Mentioned the five homers, nine ribbies. Slugging numbers are through the roof. Waste pitch outside, no shot to frame it for Humplick. For a pitch that's ahead in the zone, that was a beautifully placed pitch on the outside part of the plate. It missed, but it didn't go a long distance, which is a great pitch being ahead 0-2. Infield back on Malloy, 1-2. Malloy gets underneath it into left center field. Galligani stands beneath it, makes the squeeze. Two up and two down for Tennessee. Great start to the inning, getting the first two batters of the, the game out. And that's what you need to do to set a precedence in this, in this game against Tennessee, who's coming in with hot bats. Well, this is a much better start for South Florida in this game than for Michigan State earlier today. The Spartans gave up three runs in the opening frame. Here's McKenna Gibson from California. Pitch dives below. Tennessee, through the first three innings, and this is coming into the day, had outscored their opponents 34 to nothing. They had not allowed a run until the fourth inning this year. And that continued today. Ashley Rogers nearly getting a perfect game against Michigan State. 
as that catches a piece of McKenna Gibson. She's hit by the pitch, and she's on board with two gone for the Lady Vols. Nori really needs to limit the free passes, but in this situation, it's okay because you don't have any runners on, but giving up this free pace, now you're, base, now you're hitting, getting into the number four hitter who's one of their strongest hitters in the lineup. So McKenna Gibson reaches for now every game this year. Going to one against Michigan State earlier today, first offering a strike to Pooney. Gibson one for two earlier today against Michigan State. Pooney went three for four, three ribbies, two runs. Oh, one to the righty. Bit of a half swing back to Nori. She'll go one three, and that retires the side. So Nori and the Bulls face one above the minimum. It's the Lady Vols nothing to the Bulls to the plate when we return. Fantastic ride. The turbocharged, tech-inspired Kia Forte. Best two out of three. Well, this inning may not be over. We welcome you back very quickly to Tampa. We're waiting to see what the official call here is, but Pooney has been awarded first. Gibson goes to second, so we're still in the top of the first. We have an idea, but we'll wait until we're sure. We're thinking possibly catcher's interference. As that pitch misses for ball one, so you can scratch out the one three. We apologize to your scorebook. And here's Katsoyanopoulos. OPS over 1,000 in the early part of this year. Cuts into that one, one and one. Half a swing. And Nori is doing a great job keeping the ball high and in against the hitter and getting her to swing. And she's doing a great job keeping them off balance. That's what she needs to do with these strong hitters with Tennessee. And that rounds out the inning for Tennessee. USF to the top of the first, or bottom of the first. It's a BK stacker. Tiny dancer. Two linebackers. To each their own. Burger, swagger, satisfaction, buffet. At BK, have it your way. You rule. With the Venture X card from Capital One, you earn two times miles on every purchase. The noise canceling. You're being too loud. Good choice. Ooh, my lucky number. Plus, earn five times miles on flights mm -hmm. and ten times miles oh. on hotels through Capital One Travel. What's in your wallet? 
South Florida to the plate for the first time today. The Bulls in the home first inning after Gabrielle Nori comes up with a clutch K to retire the away half. Emily Hanlon leads off for the Bulls, and she has been stellar for South Florida this point in the season. 474 average has only knocked in two, but has been efficient on the base paths. Three of five stealing for Ken Erickson's group, and this is an offense that wants to simplify things a little bit. For Tennessee in the circle, a go to Gottschall. She has got a 2-0 record this year in an 075 ERA only allowed that one run to Liberty in a victory for Tennessee a group that has only lost one game this season got show out of Ohio originally is just four strikeouts away from 800 in her career and here's how the Lady Vols line up defensively got show three perfect games in her career as well the 2022 Mac pitcher of the year that win over Liberty, only her second start of her Tennessee career. And now she'll face the South Florida Bulls in a scoreless home first. A one to the lefty. Hanlon off speed, takes it into the air, foul ground over by Ken Erickson, and Pooney's got it. It's a pop-up to the five spot, and that's the first out of the inning. So Hallie Bryant will step in. Now in her second season with South Florida, 308 average is knocked in none, or is knocked in three, excuse me, has left the yard zero times. Originally from Trenton, Florida. Wave and a miss to pitch upstairs. Was mostly a pinch runner last year for the Bulls. Third year in the program, second year seeing action. Hit 278 last year. Already has three ribbies this year. That matches her total from last year. And it's nothing at two. Gutschel, the 0-2. Half swing down the left field line. That bloops down for a base hit. Hallie Bryant on two strikes sends it down the line, and South Florida's got their first hit of the ball game. And this is an example of good patience by Hallie Bryant on two strikes, just protecting the plate and kind of expertly places this. A pitch on the outer part slices it down that left field line and gets South Florida base runner, and that's where the Bulls are often their most potent is when they can get somebody on and you give them outs to play with, and for veteran players like Megan Sheehan, that's exactly what South Florida has the opportunity to do. First pitch, twist to the inner half, and it's nothing and one. Megan Sheehan now back to full health for South Florida. Had been banged up the last two years, didn't play in 2021 due to any injury. And dealt with a hand injury all throughout last season. Count now one and one. Now two and one on Sheehan. This is a prime opportunity early in this game for South Florida. Pounce on number nine. Two one. And a called strike evens the count. And all she and needs to do right here is put the ball in play. Bryant has speed and just put the ball as hard as you can in the ground and beat it out to give yourself an opportunity to get in scoring position. Coming home with it. Locked her up for strike three. Gotchel's got a strikeout. It's a big second out of the inning. Just a perfectly placed curveball on the inside part of the plate, right at the knees. And that's where you live as a pitcher all day long when you're looking to get strikeouts against any team. 
He's now just three away from 800 career strikeouts. Emma Humplick, even 400 average, couple of ribbies. And that misses inside. And in that situation with Sheehan, her her best at bat would have been just to try to put the ball in play and move the runner, get her in scoring position with two outs, and then you have your number four hitter, Humplick, up. And that's where you're starting to be st strategic is putting the ball in play and limiting your strikeouts. Called strike, one and one. As a pitcher, when you're approaching that kind of situation, especially with a small ball team like South Florida, how does that change your approach? I personally, if they're small ball, I like that there are a lot of rise balls. So they, if they're trying to bunt or hit the ball in the air, just trying to get something in the air where they pop out and they can't use their speed. Waves through it. Bryant takes off. The throw to the bag is not in time. Bryant swipes it. So for Hallie Bryant, that is stolen base number five this season. Gets a great jump on it. Great jump, and it's just head first dive into second. Beats the ball, and just great, great piece of running. Humplick trying to knock it in with two outs in the frame. Swipes through it, strike three. Two Ks in the inning for Gottschall. One backwards, one frontward. Ali Shipman was up with the bases loaded. Georgina Cork forces a pop-up, but this is the challenge for South Florida this year is that Georgina Cork's not in the circle. She's in the stands for 2023. And any way you can have Georgina is perfect. Being in the stands, scouting, anything that she can be a part of South Florida is a great asset to your program. Well, definitely puts all the challenge on the South Florida staff. And Gabriella Nori is back in for another inning of work. Looks good in the first. So I found out something the other day about Georgina Cork. Was talking with the South Florida staff and Georgina was there. We discovered doesn't like peanut butter. Hates it. And there's no peanut allergy. Nothing like that. Hopper over it short. Past Garcia Soto and into left. Lead off base knock for the Lady Vols, and they're in business here in the away second. I love peanut butter cake. I do too. <laughs> I, I was, we were all in disbelief, and I, oh. I promised I would mention that today. Oh, so it's there's so your good. fun fact you may not know. We talked about Georgina plenty last year, so got to take every opportunity to find new information. So, how are you going to get big biceps if you don't get your protein from your peanut butter? That's. You know, an interesting question. I'm sure there's plenty of protein sources out there. There are, but I mean, peanut butter is just it's a so good. It's a good, good one. It's a good one. Runner at first for Tennessee here in the away second. One hit for either team here. is Katie Taylor up. And I want to talk about Nori for a minute, how great she's been locating her curveball tonight and really hitting her spots and getting ahead is the biggest thing you can do as a pitcher to help yourself out. Fly ball, foul ground, right side, out of play. It'll move two strikes on Katie Taylor. Once you get ahead as a pitcher, you can throw all of your pitches at this point because you're ahead, you have the advantage. The hitter's now playing defense against you. They're just trying to fight off any pitch to put it in play and try to get a hit. So you really have the upper hand when, as a pitcher when you get ahead 0-2. Upper cuts it into foul ground out by the bullpen, and it's too long for Hamlin to go run it down. So a leadoff single for Riley West in this inning, and now Katie Taylor battling it with two strikes at the plate. Wave and a miss, strike three, the third for Nori. She is locked in to start against the Lady Vols. Nori, Nori does a great job with her her curveball on the out, well, change, curve change on the outside part of the plate and just perfectly hits that at the corner of the knees. And it's a huge out to get that first out with a runner on first base. Gabriella Nori has looked sharp to start. 
There is a pinch runner at first, by the way, we want to know, and she'll take off. Throw down to the bag is in time. They got Masuzin trying to steal, and it's the second out of the inning. How about the South Florida pitching and defense to start this game? Humpluck does a great job popping up immediately to get the runner when she sees her going, and that's the biggest thing as a catcher is how quickly can you get out of your catcher stance to get that runner? And she does such a great job. It's a bang-bang play. Her throw beats her there by quite a bit. So a strikeout, and then they catch the runner. Talk about an inning here defensively for South Florida. And Coach Erickson said this about playing Clemson in Tennessee, that you basically have to be flawless. 1-0 drops in for a strike, and so far, at least defensively, the Bulls appear to be just so. And this has to be huge momentum-wise, getting this, getting the outs that they had the way they've been getting them. They need to take that momentum and start hitting, you know, turning around with their bats and putting the ball in play, making something happen, make Tennessee work. Rodriguez chases a rise ball, and it's one and two. Boy, the late movement by Nori, that rise ball jumping way up. She's doing such a great job locating her curveball low and in, and then she'll come in high and tight on, with her rise ball, which is great. Don't leave anything over the middle of the plate for it to be crushed. Reaches for it, protects the plate, saves one and two. Destiny Rodriguez coming off an 0 for 3 game against Cal State Fullerton, was hit by a pitch. Highly recruited prospect, extra innings had her as the number 12 catcher, number 28 recruit overall. Was all state back in high school, played with the Texas Bombers gold. Nora deals on 1 2. Soft line drive, flare to the bullpen, and we'll do it again. And if I was Nora here, the way that these Tennessee hitters have been swinging at the high and tight rise ball, this is a great opportunity for her to utilize that pitch again and get it up and higher in the zone. Let's see what she goes to here on 1-2. Rodriguez fouls it off, and we'll come back and redo the 1-2. Looks like it was back-to-back changeup, so she's trying to get her really off balance to maybe come up tight in the zone or that curveball on the inside part of the plate that she's been using to get these Tennessee hitters to swing and miss. And we know you love a good back-to-back changeup. You'll throw it three times. Yes, I will. Four times, maybe. One, two, and the battle continues between the freshman and the veteran. For Destiny Rodriguez, no doubt that she wanted to be a volunteer, said, I committed as soon as they asked. She was quoted as saying, being in the starting lineup at a Power 5 school, that would fulfill everything I've ever worked for. Well, and here she is making career start number seven for the Lady Vols. That has to be so exciting when it when you get that offer that you've been dreaming of and what you've worked and put the sweat, tears, blood into to get that opportunity to commit to that school. And there's somebody else who's put the blood, sweat, and tears into this program, Karen Weekly, longtime head coach alongside Ralph, who recently retired a couple seasons back. 1-2 is popped up and playable first base side. Cadlib Cohen for it. She snaps it in. And that ends the frame. No runs, one hit, no errors, nobody left. Defense going to work, middle of two. This is the latest top ten UCLA. The Bruins stand amongst them all. Oklahoma down to two after they get a loss. Those of you who were following out west in the Mary Nutter Classic, UCLA not just beating the Gators, not just beating them in five, but a Faramo no-hitter, a Megantron no-hitter against a very potent Florida order is... This top 10 continues to shake itself out here in 2023. South Florida in this inning will send Piero, Galligani, and Vaughn. But, boy, I mean, that was a shocker last night for the Gators going down on the road in UCLA. They look sharp. Yeah, it's... It's anyone's game this early in the season. You're trying to see, like we've talked about today, see who, what everybody has. So it's, you know, great opportunity to come out and prove yourself and upset some top teams. Well, two of those teams will meet tomorrow at 11.30 here on ESPN+. Plus. We'll have the coverage, Tennessee and Clemson getting together. They met last year in the Clearwater Invitational. Piero didn't want to go around, but she did 2-1. and one. That's going to be an exciting matchup, especially with where Clemson is in their program and being so new. They're already in the top 10 and they haven't, they've been around since 2017, which is 
just shows you the talent that they're bringing in at Clemson. Piero swipes through it two and two. It's a very young program over there at Clemson. In most programs, it takes years to build up, and Clemson's just jumped right in and full force have made it in the top 10. Piero swings through it for strike three. That's three straight Ks for Gottschall going back to the first. There's Ken Erickson, longtime head coach of Team USA, now in year number 26, has gotten this team to 16 at NCAA tournaments. And, you know, it's funny, Allison, it, this program has had so much discourse around it about no more Georgina Cork. Alexis Johns decided to end her career. And, you know, everybody, there's all these questions about South Florida, but Ken Erickson's programs, they always seem to find more pitchers. They always seem to find more players who can swing about. And, there they are at the end of the year of the NCAA tournament. Tallahassee, Gainesville, they always seem to find their way there. And that just shows you how great of a coaching staff he has to get these girls to come in here and to recruit them, to get them committed to a, a team like South Florida. They play such great, and that's the other thing they have. They play great competition year in, year in and year out, playing Tennessee, Clemson. It's just an awesome schedule against great teams. Wave and a miss, one and two. You touched on Clemson. We were talking with John Rittman the other day, and he had talked about not just Clemson, but Duke being a new program in the ACC and how, you know, you almost blink, and it's no longer the days where it's just Florida State, Virginia Tech, and Notre Dame kind of running the league. They're getting depth quickly as Gallagani strikes out. That is now four straight for Gottschall. We've been talking about Nori being in his own zone. How about Gottschall so far? She's doing a great job, just like Nori, just utilizing the zone on the inside, outside, and then she'll come up in the zone with her rise ball, and it's so effective right now because these left-handed hitters are used to slapping, and they're swinging underneath the ball. Vaughn fouls it back, and you know, Tennessee, a blue blood in this sport, is going to play Clemson tomorrow again, a, a ring match of last year's, well, classic in Clearwater. And... You know, you mentioned that program's been around since 2017. They've only been playing since 2020, and that was a truncated year. So if you just look at the data points from the last two years, that's regional and then hosted a regional and got to a super regional in Stillwater. As Vaughn's down 0-2, a chance for Gottschall to strike out the side. Yeah, it's just, just to hear those stats is just mind-blowing, and it shows you, just like Ken Erickson, the talent that they're able to bring in and the buy-in that they're able to get. And I think it goes to who they get to play. Vaughn chases a rise ball high in the zone, and that retires the conference player. And, well, we had talked about with Josie Foreman and Georgina Cork that oftentimes Ken Erickson's staffs, they'll call their own games, but South Florida, in, going into the FGCU game this week, changed it up. Now, Coach Claudio Rivera is calling the pitches for South Florida, and it seems to be working because since they did that, Gabrielle Nori looks really comfortable. She does. I think it takes the thought out of it as a pitcher. Because you have to think, you have to analyze the hitter. What am I going to throw and how am I going to spin the pitch? Right. So Nori, it takes it all out of her. Now she, all she has to focus on is spinning the pitch and placing it where she needs to put it. And it works out so well because she's been placing her curveball and rise ball so well since she's taken on that role. And we don't know this with 100% certainty, but oftentimes coming from other programs, that's, that's more of the norm for a lot of pitchers is that their pitches are called for them. And there's a huge upside in having them call it their own games, right, and that you're learning the game. But on the flip side of it, we just addressed it, that it brings that comfort level for maybe somebody like Gabrielle and Ori. And I can't think of a program other than South Florida with Georgina Korik that – allows their pitcher to call their own game. Most consistently, the, with consistent, everybody. Yes, right. and now I, they have so much data on these hitters, so they're, they know what their weakness is, and the pitcher doesn't have, they take that thought out of it. So it's a huge advantage having somebody call the pitches. Now, did I like that personally? No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you're one of a kind, Allison. Yes, uh, you know. But you fun. like, but I mean, everybody's different, and I think that's, but that's a sign of good coaching, right, is that you're not trying to put the square peg in the round hole. You're willing to adjust what you're doing to work with your personnel, right? That is correct, yes. 
And sends this up into the screen, and we'll do the payoff again. I think more and more of these players, as they come through, are used to somebody calling their game. Mm -hmm. When I was in travel ball, we didn't have all this technology. It was just like, all right, go out and throw. If you make a mistake, fix it. Now right. they have all this data that I think they've kind of been programmed to have somebody else call it, and then you, you pick where you throw it. Seventh pitch of the at-bat here, 3-2. This is inside, and it's a leadoff walk for Allwood. But I think the South Florida pitching staff has really benefited a lot from her calling these games. You see Nori more relaxed and more confident. I, f I see her spinning her pitches a lot more than in previous games, and it's just, I think that's the confidence level that she has somebody out there that believes in her, and it's calling this pitch for a reason. Carla Claudio Rivera also spent some team with, time with the Puerto Rican national team. Was a member of Tim Walton's staff of the University of Florida. First season as a grad assistant. Got her master's from UF and now back with Ken Erickson. So the alumni of South Florida calling the pitches as they go back to the top of the order. Tennessee now a chance to adjust. If you're the volunteers, how do you counter what Nori's presented so far? I think they need to pick out one of the pitches, either outside or inside, where Nori's throwing and capitalize on that. She's hitting her spot so well at the right part of the plate at the knees. So it's kind of unhittable at this point, so they just need to put something in play and limit those strikeouts. Donahue Cade, her first time up to the plate. Nori uncorks a two-strike pitch. Waves through it, foul tip into the glove for strike three. Two Ks for the plus 500 hitter, and it puts the first out on the board. And such a huge strikeout for Nori going up in the zone with the rise ball and getting Donahue out and for that first out of the inning, especially with somebody that's so powerful at the top of the lineup. Kiki Malloy back up, one gone, one on. Malloy on the first pitch sends it skyward to the right field line, and that's into the bullpen. And here's the thing, just because you got Donahue out doesn't make the rest of the lineup that much easier because now you have Malloy, Gibson, you have so many tough hitters, one through nine. They're all productive, and that's how they get that, you know, average of nine runs a game. It's not just the top three hitters. It's one through nine that are productive and make things happen. This is basically the ideal situation for Tennessee. Swipes that to the screen. It'll move two strikes. So they get the leadoff walk from the nine-hole hitter, and then you give Donahue, Malloy, and Gibson all chance to potentially go up and cut it, barring a double play. And you have Puni that's up coming up, and she's their team leading RBI. So it's just, you know, hitter after hitter that's can really hurt you if you leave anything over the zone. Boy, that pitch just barely misses. Ball one. Kiki Malloy. Last year led the Lady Vols. Average runs, hits, doubles, home runs, RBI. If there's a statistical category, she was probably on top of it. 36 career homers coming into the day. Outside, low and away, ball two. And on that last pitch that was so close that Nori threw, as a pitcher, you want that call from the umpire so badly <laughs> because these Tennessee hitters are so tough and you're trying to get any little, any little break that you can get, that little, even if it's off just a smidge, you want that as a South Florida pitcher. 2-2 two -two is sent upward into right field. Hanlon squeezes it home, two down. Boy, that is spoken like an ace pitcher if I've ever heard it. <laughs> yeah. You're still kind of nudging a little bit to get that call. I, you want it so bad as a pitcher because I see these <laughs> hitters in the lineup and I'm like, man, it's like you don't get a break. It's not like, all right, here's hitter number seven. I'm going to get a little break. No, you're throwing your best stuff every single pitch and it's tiresome. Down to third of the order. Gibson again. She got hit by a pitch in the first. One free pass in this inning on a walk has put a runner on base for Tennessee. Donahue leading the nation in doubles right now with seven two baggers this year. I'd say that's pretty good. 1 0 to the sophomore from Gabriella Nori. And time will be called. Gibson from Santa Clara, California. 
Sorry, Sarah, Santa Clarita, California. 1-0 pitch. Inside for a strike. Runner takes off. The throw to the bag in time from Humplick. The second time they've caught Tennessee trying to steal. How about the arm of Humplick? She guns down another. Just a great play. Great play uh, bouncing in and stop to the, the black bat. This is sometimes looked even better. And it's so hard as a catcher to make those plays with a, a, a runner trying to steal on you. So it's huge. First pitch strike to Garcia Soto, the freshman. 059 on the average. On the season, just one hit and 17 tries. Well, let's talk a little bit about what Tennessee has done in the circle so far because Peyton Gottschall is having an incredible game. She has surpassed 800 career strikeouts tonight with five. She's now got 801. And Gottschall's being so effective with her her, uh, her curveball and her rise ball. Once she gets ahead, she's throwing that rise ball out of the zone, and South Florida hasn't been able to catch up to it. She is struck out five of the first seven in his eyes to make it six of the first eight. And there you go. Chased it outside. Make it six strikeouts in a row for Gottschall. And that's the confidence that you want from a pitcher, just going in and going right after these South Florida hitters and attacking them. Don't give them any opportunities to put the ball in play, throw your game and throw your pitches. Jordan Cadlib in the nine hole tonight for South Florida. That's placed in for strike one. Peyton Gottschall transfer from Bowling Green now facing Cadlub. This is a familiar opponent for Jordan Cadlip. We mentioned these teams in recent years, going back to 2018, have met three times. They met twice in 2020. Cadlip was a part of that team. 0-1 chases inside at the shoulders. 0-2, oh, and, and in that game, scored one of the winning runs in the seventh inning walk-off on a home run. She has struck out six. And misses upstairs, ball one. And South Florida needs to find a way to put the ball in play, make the Tennessee defense work. Right now, these strikeouts are not giving them any opportunities to find a way on base. One, two, plate word. Got her. Strikes out seven of the first nine and seven in a row. Well, Peyton Gottschall. No stranger to tearing it up. She has thrown three perfect games in her career. They were all at Bowling Green. It struck out every single batter in that game sandwiched in there against Green Bay. 15 Ks in one game. Allison, there's good, and then there's elite, and then there's doing that. And I have no words because I've never thrown a perfect game. So to throw three in your career in college is outstanding. That show, and tonight she's throwing one of those games. Yes, South Florida has gotten a hit against her, but she is throwing the, that type of game where she can throw her rise ball and her curveball. She mixes up the zone. She mixes up the speeds and keeps the hitter off balance. And that's what you do to get these perfect games. And also a little bit behind it too is your defense. If you don't have a great def defense backing you up, you're never going to throw a perfect game because that one error, you don't get a perfect game. 2022 Mac Pitcher of the Year. Hanlon pops it up. May not get a strikeout here, but she will get a pop out to retire the side. So, meeting tonight as we get underway in the top of the fourth inning. Series is tied 11 11 all time. So, winner tonight gets to take control of the series. Bragging rights. Just a little bit. As Tennessee coming on down from Rocky Top. This is part of a 28 game homestand for South Florida. And the Bulls, you know, and this is something we see every year from South Florida. They play an onslaught of home games through February and March. But because of where this program is located in Tampa, we're currently at 79 degrees. It's not that warm most places. They can attract teams like Tennessee, like Clemson, like Florida to come play in this facility. And that's screamed into the screen, one and two. 
Got UIC in Michigan as well into this ballpark. I mean, this is really, I mean, kind of the big upside of being in the state of Florida is that you can have a 28-game homestand and not play a road game, a true road game until late March, early April. Nori sends it home. And another foul into right field. And I also think it's huge when you have Coach Erickson also on that sideline that mm -hmm. knows all of these coaches. He was a part of the USA Olympic team. So he can also bring in these caliber of teams. And they want to come in because they know Coach Erickson. And he's a, he's a great guy. He has a great personality. And that's how he gets such a great program year after year is he knows how to recruit these girls and bring them to their home field. Wave and a miss. Gabrielle and Nori's got five Ks tonight for South Florida. Boy, what a breakout week for Gabriella Norris. She had a double-digit strikeout night against FGCU, and she's got number nine Tennessee off balance. And Norris just once again does a great job getting ahead and then throwing that rise ball way out of the zone so Tennessee doesn't have an opportunity to hit the ball a long ways in the opposite direction. Zeta Pooney steps up. Pooney reached on catcher's interference back in the first. But on the flip side, I know that, you know, South Florida loves to play on their home field and host a, a ton of tournaments. When I played at University of Central Florida, we did host some tournaments, but it was also fun to take that travel team to mm -hmm. go. We went out to California. My senior year, we got to go to Hawaii. So it's kind of fun to also see the country in that same aspect. And I knew, okay, a nine-hour flight, I'm, I don't think I'm ever going back to Hawaii again. <laughs> I think that was a little bit of a subtle flex that you went to Hawaii. You just tried to slip that in there nonchalantly. Yeah, a little, little bicep flex. Did you, get to, did you get to go to the beach at all when you are there, or was it all business? Yeah, no, we did. Not all business. That's the beauty of it. When you go on these trips, yes, 95% of the time when you go to these big trips, it's to get those RPI ratings. But you do like to look, sprinkle in some fun in there. So I remember oh, gotcha. going. Yeah, we, I remember going to one of these fancy restaurants, Duke, um, ate so much pineapple, our, our tongues were raw. Uh, <laughs> we went on the famous beach, and we saw a huge turtle. Way high and inside on one, two. That one got away. I mean, how big are we talking? Is this thing a size of Bowser? Give me Pro a frame of reference. Probably. I was way in a distance, <laughs> and that thing was massive from where I was standing. But I think that's a part of the recruiting, too, is to not only do you get home field advantage, advantage, but from other schools like Tennessee, not only do you have the prestigious factor, but, hey, we travel to all these other places that you get to see. In the air, deep left center field to the wall, and it's off the base of the wall. Thinking three, the throw coming in wide and in well safe. Zeta Pooney's got a triple for Tennessee. And Galligan needed to run back as fast and as hard as she could because that ball was hit so hard and so far. And if it went over the fence, that's fine. It was definitely going the distance, but it just hit, it looks like, the top of it. But she should have ran back as hard as fast as she could and set up underneath of there as best as she could because it, she kind of, like, jogged back there trying to find out where she was. As a hitter, and I've heard this described this way before, that hitting a triple is one of the hardest things, if not the hardest thing, to do as a hitter. Everything has to be in your favor. Like in that situation, it bounced off the fence, so it, it went a little way. So Punini was able to get a triple out of that. I don't know if you know Prince Fielder. He's a pretty big guy. He yeah. used to play for the Milwaukee Brewers, but he used to hit triples all the time because mm -hmm. it's all about where you place it. And just once you get that momentum, you can mosey around those bases pretty quickly. Yeah. Throwing another baseball term in there. Banana around the bag, and you're going to get that triple. There you go. <laughs> Look at you. you <laughs> bring out the vocab tonight. <laughs> you're on one. You're absolutely owning it. Katsoya Napolis struck out against Nori in the first. Boy, the Bulls could really use a strikeout. She's ahead 2-0. And fouls this off, two balls and a strike. So a one-out triple for Tennessee, first of the year for Pooney. And the Lady Vols have something cooking in the away fourth. How big would a second out be for South Florida? This is absolutely huge to get this out and not allow a run to be scored right now. But she's in scoring position with only one out, so anything to the outfield is potentially going to score her. The Arizona transfer fans it, two and two. 
If you're Nori, what are you going to here? I'd say continue to throw that rise ball. Make sure it's out of the zone because anything that's left in there, a deep fly ball is going to going to score Panini. So she needs to be smart about where she places this pitch. Takes the 2-2 into the netting. We've seen Gabrielle and Nori fight through some at bats as well in critical moments. And that's what a veteran pitcher can do for you. And Coach Erickson, he called her the transition pitcher for what is a very young overall staff. Yeah, Nori just has this different build about her tonight. I can't, I can't find the words. She just has this confidence on the mound tonight. Pop up first baseline. Cadillac running in has got it. Maybe the perfect pop-up for South Florida keeps Pooney at third. And now any out gets you out of the inning after the one-out triple. She's really taking a stance and really owning that circle tonight. And she just has this different air about her tonight. She's just really attacking the hitters and getting ahead, utilizing curveballs. And when she's ahead, she's throwing the rise ball and getting the outs when she needs them. Riley West will come up, and Coach Weekly came and had something to give to the home plate umpire, William lopez Pello. Shane Jackson's at first, by the way. Mike Burwell's at third. <laughs> Beg your pardon. This, that's what it was. They were re-entering her for... Miss Susan. First offering out in front of it. Came in at 66. 0-1. Seems like Gabrielle Inori tonight has won that first pitch a lot. She has. She's utilizing those pitches once again. Curveball in in the zone or the rise ball up in the zone, way out of the zone. She's not leaving pitches hanging where she has in the past. 0-1 chopped out of play. And I just think the biggest change I can see in her is how she's carrying herself on the mound with the confidence and really spinning her pitch. She looks like she's that number one pitcher out there that Ken Erickson wants her to be. As an ace, you have to own that role, right? You do. The good and the bad. With whatever happens, you own it. 0-2. Oh, Gives it a charge towards right center field. This is playable. Hanlon's got it. And that retires the side. Nori gets into a bit of a jam, one triple in the inning, but we remain goose egg. South Florida, Tennessee. She deserves to wear this uh, Tennessee uniform tonight. Gottschall, the Bowling Green transfer, surpassing 800 career Ks, has struck out seven of the last eight. All of those seven were in a row. First pitch ambush from Bryant. Up in the air, who's got it? It's Pooney, one down. So when you got a pitcher who's in a groove like that, is that the strategy? Do you have to come out swinging to try and just find something to hit? I think that's South Florida's strategy right now because they keep just swinging and missing and letting Gotchel get ahead of these hitters. So come out swinging, put something in play. I don't know that you're going to rattle her per se, but try to, you know, try to get her not in that groove anymore. The very least, you can find something that works. The way both pitchers have been tonight, one run might be enough. Well, Megan Sheehan's a pretty good candidate to get something going. Yeah, anything that they can push ac across the, the plate is going to be a huge momentum change because of how well both of these pitchers have thrown tonight. That was a big stop for South Florida in the away fourth. 0-1, pulls it over to second. Rodriguez to Gibson. 4-3, so quickly two up and two down for South Florida. Brings in Emma Humplick. This is a good momentum change for South Florida. Instead of having all these strikeouts, make Tennessee work. Make them put the ball in play. Make them make an error. Because having all these strikeouts not making the defense work at all. And that's the whole point. Is more that you put in play, the more Tennessee can make an error. Public first pitch. It's framed by Kutsoya Napolis for strike one. Emma Humplick played for a nationally ranked Texas Bombers Club. That was under John Car Carpenter. Originally committed to Texas A&M as a freshman. A lot of ties to the school. 0-1, wipes through it, 
Her great grandpa was actually the head of course at A&M. But when the pandemic hit and everybody got their extra year, they closed a window for her at Texas A&M. They no longer had a spot for her, so she had to reopen her commitment, so it broke her heart a little bit. O'Till wave and a miss, strikes out, and that retires the side. But now she's a South Florida Bull, and we're through four at Tampa. 0-0. Yes. Back for another flound of your sandwich? And a shrimp tackle box. Let us do the fishing while y'all enjoy our seafood that you'll love. Get them before they're gone. With the Venture X card from Capital One, you earn two times miles on every purchase. The noise canceling. You're being too loud. Good choice. My lucky number. Plus, earn five times miles on flights mm -hmm. and ten times miles oh. on hotels through Capital One Travel. What's in your wallet? Billy Mole and the Bulls baseball team. Next home series, March 3rd through the 5th, hosting the Northeastern Huskies. Right over next door at USF Baseball Stadium. Friday night, first pitch, 6.30. Saturday afternoon at 2, Sunday at 1. If you can't be there, all three games live right here on ESPN+. Boy, what a start to the year for South Florida baseball. They take one from number 13 Maryland in their home park, and then after kind of a tight one with Florida on Tuesday, they go into Gainesville. They were down 8-3 going into the ninth. They score seven runs in an inning and walk out of Gainesville with a 10-9 win. Something about Condren Ballpark for USF Baseball has been friendly in recent years. It's exciting when baseball puts up those numbers and have that kind of, that, those kind of innings because typically baseball's a slow-moving game. So when you see those run productions, it's, a, it's an exciting game. I'll tell you what, not as slow this year. They instituted a pitch clock in college baseball and all of a sudden you got games routinely finishing under three hours and it has sped things up over on the baseball side of things. We get started here in the fifth, South Florida and Tennessee. And leading off this inning, it's the bottom of the order, Katie Taylor in the seventh spot. And as this game goes along for South Florida, it kind of snowballs that confidence, right? Because every time you go out there again, you're looking up at the scoreboard and you're tied with the number nine team in the country. Yeah, it shows that South Florida can hang with them as long as their pitchers are getting ahead, like Nori tonight with her curveball and utilizing the rise ball out of the zone and letting her defense work, you can compete with any of these teams when you give your team the opportunity. Now they just got to get their bats going and get some run production on the board. 1-1. One, one. Line drive, smoke to second, and Piero's there to grab it. On a leap, she reels it to the glove. That's a big stop at the four spot for Megan Piero. Such a solid hit, well played by Piero, just being able to jump up. That ball was hit so hard, and she just stuck with it. Just nice job playing with that because Taylor really got that whole piece of it, and if, if Piero didn't stop that, that was going to go a long way to the outfield with the speed on that ball. Well, she had a catch the other night, too, diving into foul ground. Megan Piero, the bat has been a little on and off, but the defense has looked stellar out at second base for South Florida. Destiny Rodriguez, for her second trip, popped up to first on her last appearance. And on the first offering, lasers it to the South Florida dugout. And those kind of plays, I mean, it feels like it's been this back and forth defensively with South Florida, where if it's not Nori, it's the infield. If it's not the infield, it's Humplick. It's not just one person. We've seen multiple players making plays tonight. And that's how you win ball games. It's not just one person in particular that's going to win you a game. The whole defense, defense, offense, hitting has to all come together to win a game. And that clunks off the blue bat for a foul. Two strikes. And that's where both teams are kind of falling short tonight is no run production. Three hits in total on tonight. So, and this is not a typical Tennessee team where they're, they're used to high run production. So they had to get their bat swinging. Swing early in the count. Don't let Nora get ahead and then utilize her rise ball out of the zone. 
0-2, weekly head out to short. Garcia Soto vacuums it up over to Kadlov, and there's two away. And for pitchers, it's not just about the K numbers. We've seen good strikeout numbers on both sides, but sometimes it's winning the battle by just letting your defense go to work, right? Sometimes that's half the battle is just letting your defense do the work, especially against a tough team like Tennessee. They're going to put the ball in play. They're not used to striking out a whole lot. They're used to putting the ball in play, getting hits, making the defense work, and that's what they have to do and get back to those basics. Mander all in, walked back in the third to turn it over. Much different situation here. Line on Gabriella Nori. Only two hits to an offense for Tennessee that frankly has been lighting it up so far in 2023. I mean, we were here watching the Michigan State-Tennessee game before this one. Check swing, and that drops down into left center field. So right on cue, puts that offense on display. Third hit of the night for Tennessee. And nothing has to be fancy. You just need to put the ball in play, and things do happen. You get those fluke balls that drop in, or, you know, it falls into that no man's land territory. And that's all you have to do as a hitter is try to put the ball in play to make something happen. Not necessarily make a defense make error, but put the ball in play, and you never know where the ball is going to drop. Tennessee beat Michigan State earlier today, 13-0. Ashley Rogers nearly had a perfect game against Sparty. That misses. But this offense, I mean, 13 runs earlier today, came into this weekend hitting 623 as a team. That's top 10 in the country. The home run numbers are through the roof. You remember last year, 12th most home runs per game, top 20 in slugging. This team can hit ever since they added Chris Malvo. They have really taken off. One of the top offensive assistants in the country coming over from Missouri. They get on base, they hit for power, but so far, South Florida has kept them contained. But if there is an offense that can crack the code, Tennessee is a pretty good candidate. I was here for that end part of that Tennessee game, the last few innings, and they come up, they come up swinging. They get their money's worth. They're going to take their cuts, and they're going to go all in. They're not going to half cut anything. This is the SEC teams in the top 25. You know, I was talking about this with some of the Tennessee folks earlier, but you think about how this league is going to look when Oklahoma and Texas show up to the party. I mean, those are the two teams that played for a national title last year. And, I mean, you've already got four in the top ten, and then LSU, Georgia, Kentucky, Auburn, Missouri. And, by the way, there's other teams in the SEC knocking on the door of being in the top 25. I mean, year over year, you could functionally basically put the entire conference in the NCAA tournament, if not all but one. It is an extremely deep league. Went around, Dan Donahue, who was struck out twice tonight, down two and one, or ahead two and one, excuse me. And that's the hard part with the SEC lineup is each weekend you go in, you're going to play tough and competitive teams, and they're going to wear you down. Tennessee this year considered one of the favorites to maybe win the SEC. Gators got five first place votes. They were the preseason favorites. Tennessee got three. Alabama got the other five, but Tennessee finished second in the voting. So there are a lot of people around the SEC who feel like this version of Tennessee, they're a contender to win the conference this year. And that would be the first time if they were to do so since 2011. They've got three all-time in program history, two tournament titles in 06 and 2011. In 2007, the regular season title. That may not sound like a lot, but the SEC is hard to win in. Yes, because you see all the t the teams right. in the top, <laughs> the top, the, the top 25. Three two is sent into the screen. We'll do a payoff again with two gone. And I can see why Tennessee's ranked so highly. A 623, I think, is what you said batting average as a team. That's showing you one through nine. Everybody's making something happen and putting things in play, putting the bat on the ball, getting hits. It's not just the top of the lineup. When you have a stat like that, it's everybody in the lineup that's producing. Two strike pitch. Softly lined to right center field, tails towards the warning track. Red light at third as the throw comes in. Two outs and Snorri is cornered.
By the way, just to correct that earlier note, was referring to their slugging, not their average, but that was still at 350, and this is part of the reason why. And, yeah, Donahue just fi it's just finding a place to fa hit, have the ball fall in and get a hit and move your runner. And especially with two outs, this is a prime time to score right now with your top of your lineup. This is the third time through. So Nori really needs to start changing it up a little bit more because these hitters have already seen her. They know what she's going to throw. They know her pitch count and what she's going to throw this go around. Allen goes first to third. She's on the doorstep. Tennessee left a runner stranded in the fourth at third after the Pooney triple. Two hits in the inning for the Vols. And it's Kiki Malloy. Lady Vols only one loss this year. That was to Cal State Fullerton. Can't frame it, 2-0. And Nori does a great job because she knows this is a, 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 part of the, uh, a part of the game that Tennessee can really capitalize and score right here. So throwing that change up blowing the zone to keep her off balance, change her eye level, change speed. This is an important part of the game that she really needs to start mixing it up level-wise, zone-wise, and speed-wise. 2-0. Malloy stands in for a strike. Boy, if you're Tennessee and you're in a scoreless top of the fifth, is there anybody you'd rather have up than Kiki Malloy? And Noy does a great job once again just with the curb on the outside part of the zone, and that's where she needs to live with these Tennessee hitters, low in the zone, mixing the eye level up. Two one to Malloy. Malloy gets underneath it in the air to right center field. Going back and gone. Three run shot for Kiki Malloy. And like that, Tennessee has a 3 0 lead. Nori just leaves the ball hanging over the middle of the plate. And Malloy is such a great hitter. Nori's had her number twice and just leaves that over, belt high in the middle of the plate and just is able to get every piece of that ball. Off the base of the scoreboard for Kiki Malloy, sixth home run of the year for number nine. And Nori had her number all night, getting her to fly out, and just this one time you leave the ball up in the zone and that's when it hurts you as a pitcher. So finally, Tennessee breaks through. And now for Gabriella Nori, how do you have a short memory and just move along? Exactly. She needs to just forget about it. Have that same appearance on the mound, having that confidence, because I see her face kind of changing a little bit on the mound. She needs to have that confidence and have that faith. She's held them through this many innings. She can still do it. In her half strike, one and one. And the last thing you need to do is have this compound. You have two outs. You're able to get out of the inning. It's only three runs. Fans through it, one and two. And when I say it's only three runs, I mean, Gottschall's throwing one heck of a game with nine strikeouts. So South Florida on the flip side needs to figure out how to solve her and how to get the ball in play and how to get some runners on bases to get somebody across the board and not be shut out. One, two to Gibson. Gibson check swing. Did she go around? She did. Dolls, cheerleaders, and Rocky. He's going to be in attendance. Fans can register for a free mobile ticket to this event visiting USF Bulls. Visit GoUSFBulls.com. Going to get the URL right in South Florida. has got to get the offense right here in the home fit. They're down by three to Tennessee thanks to Kiki Malloy's three-run shot. Well, the last time they got together, a home run was the difference. Could we have some deja vu tonight? The way that Gacho's throwing, I can't imagine she's going to give up a home run, but Every pitcher does give a mistake every at bat, is, but is USF able to capitalize on it? And they haven't so far this game. Piero shows a little butt, takes a strike, one and two. Well, Megan Piero is one of the big offensive weapons that Ken Erickson pointed to in the preseason that was coming back. As we said, it's been up and down for her. A sub in Doza line average, but has got two triples. So she's got speed, as a lot of this South Florida team does. 
And sometimes your, your at-bats don't reflect in your batting average. Pierre can have great at bats, it's just not falling her way, or they're just making great plays. Mm. And they're playing great teams, so that is a great possibility that the teams that she's playing against, they're playing these they're making exceptional plays. Outside corner, strike three. Big pump of the fist from William Lopez Pelop. And South Florida down and out. Megan Pierre strikes out for the second time tonight. Just unfortunately, Megan Pierre is not able to read that pitch on the outside part of the plate and Tennessee is able just to, to frame that pitch and get that out, that first out of the inning. Nine strikeouts tonight for Gottschall. Galagani's down 0-1. Look at these numbers on first pitch strikes in batters faced, 11 of 14. When you do that, you're gonna get a lot of strikeouts. And I can guarantee the pitching coach over in Tennessee is very happy to see those <laughs> stats because that's what you work on in the bullpen is get that first pitch strike. That would be Megan Rhodes-Smith. She's in her third season as a coach. That's a strike on the inner half. That makes you a happy coach when you see stats thrown up like that, that your pitcher is attacking the zone, getting ahead of the hitters, because that's going to play an important part when you get into these conference games. Allegheny cuts through it, and that is the 10th strikeout tonight for Gacho. And Gottschall's just on fire. She is, has that confidence in the mound, spinning her pitches, and making South Florida chase balls out of the zone and not picking out pitches within that zone. For Peyton Gottschall, this shatters a previous season high of six strikeouts against Liberty off speed. In at 65, looked kind of off speed, may not have been. 53rd offerings a strike to Tylee Vaughn. And Gottschall's just on fire tonight. She has that presence that she's bringing to the circle and just really throwing her pitches with confidence. Gottschall struck out the side in the second against five, six, and seven. She's got five and six. Can she do it twice? Tylee Vaughn, sub 100 average so far this year. One and two. And for South Florida, you know, it's no secret. They know the offensive numbers aren't where they want it to be at this point in the year. You, you put aside the fact they played a bunch of very hard teams, including four teams either receiving votes from the top 25 out in Clearwater, but trying to simplify things. That's really where South Florida's been the last week. Stands in for ball two. Yeah, they have to simplify it and get back to the basics. I haven't. They haven't had the opportunity to play the small ball. What they're known for doing is getting somebody on base, moving them around with a bunt or with, with speed. They haven't had an opportunity because of all the strikeout that Gotchel's thrown tonight. 2-2. Two, two. Drops it in for strike three. She struck out five, six, and seven in the second. Does it again in the fifth. Through five, Tennessee by three. just with the speed and how do you catch up with something that's just so quick and that's why she's just frozen in the box and able to, unable to pull the trigger. We've talked about the movement flashing the velo in Tennessee flashing the home run power as they've got a three nothing lead on five hits tonight. No runs only one hit for South Florida. If not for a single in the first inning by Hallie Bryant We'd be looking at a gotcha perfect game for maybe the fourth time in her career. I'm sure that Karen Weekly and the staff would be more than happy with a one-hit shutout. Absolutely, and it, she's pitched that type of game that it looks like she's throwing a perfect game with the amount of strikeouts back to back to back. It's just South Florida has to figure it out, and Gottschall's able just to throw her speed as fast as she can. South Florida will go to the bullpen to start off the sixth inning. Antoinette Hill, the senior, she's been playing a little bit more of a closer role for South Florida as of late. What can we expect? And the reason she's playing that closing role, she has that drop on the changeup to keep these hitters off balance later in the game, and it mixes it up from what Nori throws. It throws. Antoinette Hill pitched an inning against Clemson, gave up a couple of runs on three hits. Walked one, struck out none. She had a career high seven against FGCU in game two, four and two thirds in that one against the Eagles. She had a strong finish to 2022. She only pitched an inning at Purdue before she transferred here and had a save against FAMU last year. 
also had a win against Wichita State at the end of the year and then got a save against the Shockers in the AAC tournament. So somebody that is on the older side for what is overall a young staff. She's a senior and should have one more year of eligibility because of that 2020 year. But for the Bulls, it's going to be more major league in the approach this year. You're not going to see as many complete games, even from somebody like Gabrielle Nori, that, yes, yeah, she got the strikeout to finish the inning, but that's just it's just a different mentality this year. It is, and just like the, sh the small ball is South Florida's M.O., so is the pitching changes. That's mm -hmm. what they are known for is to any type of trouble they get into, they're going to switch it out. You didn't have those issues last year with Cork because – Cork was Cork. Right. You know, Cork threw great When you games. have a Georgina Cork, you don't pull her. <laughs> no. She very rarely got into trouble. So, and not saying that Nori was in trouble, but now facing the lineup, this tough team again through the lineup, she did start to get some, see some trouble third time through the lineup. And so that's where Karen Erickson comes into play is he's going to pull the hitter third time through. They've seen her so many times. I need to switch up the, the zone, the eye level. And what perfect way from going from a curveball pitcher to a drop ball pitcher. I think you'd agree that for South Florida, yes, Nori gave up a three-run home run. That's to Kiki Malloy, who is one of the best hitters, if not just in the SEC, in the country. Pooney leads off, and she takes in the basement for ball one. But, yeah, you gave up a three-run home run, but she did a lot of good things for South Florida tonight, and that's really promising for a group that's still finding its footing. She gave them some great innings, kept the ball in the park. Just that one mistake hurt her, and that's what will happen when you face great teams. Ropes that into right center, and that dunks down against the fencing. Pooney rounds first, goes into second, standing up. Had a triple in the fourth, now she's got a double in the sixth. And Pooney's just able to go to the opposite side of the field. Ball left over the plate, and she's able just to get all of that ball and hit it extremely hard to the outfield and lay out a double. Reached on catcher's interference in the first. Tripled, now doubled. Pooney stepped into this game. Three doubles on the year, no triples, no home runs. Have a pinch runner into the game. This is good luck. So Shakar Goodlow will run it second. First pitch drops to Katsoyanopoulos. It's 1 0. And Tennessee puts in a quicker runner because they just don't want to stop at three. They want to see as many, they want to get as many runs as they can across the board against South Florida. Because in their mind, three runs is not enough. 1 0 to Katsoyanopoulos. Squares to butt, and it'll be foul 1 and 1. So maybe the Lady Vols trying to give South Florida a little taste of their own medicine with the small ball. And with nobody out and a runner at second, you think that's probably a pretty wise strategy from Karen Weekly and company. Her and Ralph Weekly, softball royalty in this sport for years and years. Ralph recently retiring after the 21 season. Created a real family atmosphere over at Tennessee, and that's really appealing to a lot of recruits, especially you think about the transition to college, right, and having that kind of environment to step into. I mean, that's really appealing. Oh, absolutely. It's almost like you have mom and dad there again. Right. It's like, what better way to enter college with two amazing people that they have at Tennessee? Off the bag, Humplick threatening, and there's nobody covering for South Florida. So Pooney retreats to second. It's two and two. Well, they have been figures in this sport for years. They started as a pair at Chattanooga. And they made their way to Tennessee. Co-head coaches for years and years. They produced 38 All-Americans. Spikes that wide at third. Yeah, like you said, just a staple. Just like any other college coach. Like Walton, staple. Update the defense for you. Eichemann is coming at left field. Garcia Soto scooted to second. Galagani is at short, and Natalie Zwei comes in at third. Everything else remains the same. 
Low in the zone, two and two. Or a little beneath the zone, I should say. Payoff from Hill. And swings at that for a foul. How about another 3-2? So some defensive changes for South Florida. And I, I think part of the calculus here, if you're Coach Erickson, is you've got Tennessee in your ballpark. And this is a good opportunity for, again, what is a very young roster to see elite-level softball. Tennessee is undoubtedly a top 10 team. This team looks really, really good so far this year. So there is value in this moment for South Florida to go to the bench and make some switches, right, to get some different looks for these players. Yeah, and just to get those hitters in because the current hitters in the lineup haven't had much luck with all their strikeouts. With You know, they're not putting much activity in play. Reaches four, three, two is off of Garcia Soto's glove. Wave at third. And the throw is cut off by Hill. A run scores, and Tennessee extends the lead to four. Goodlow scores the run for the Lady Vols. And Pierre does a nice job trying to stop the ball and knocks it down from going to the outfield. And just is unable to come up with a play. I'm sorry, Garcia Soto is unable just to come up with a play, but does a great job stopping it and preventing... Um, preventing the hitter from getting multiple bases. Eighth ribby of the year for Kutsoyanopoulos, and she stands at first, and the first pitch is lined to right field. Kutsoyanopoulos goes from first to third, back-to-back -back base hits for the Lady Vols, three in a row. And that's not how you need to start the inning with Hill giving up hit, three back-to-back -back hits. She needs to calm down keep the ball low in the zone. And where she's kind of struggling right now, she didn't get ahead of any of her hitters, so she needs to get ahead, have that same approach that Nori did, and trust her pitches. Katie Taylor will take some swings. She's 0 for 2 with a K. What's impressed you about this Tennessee offense tonight? Resiliency. They just... They were shut back down by Nori, but when Hill comes in, the bats kind of exploded. Another first pitch swing. Cadlib looks at a couple of runners, goes to second, and gets it out on the board. So, Riley West is retired. And Taylor reaches on the fielder's choice, four to six. You can almost see the gears turning on that play defensively. Yeah, she was trying to get that lead runner, which almost was going to hurt her because she hesitated too much. She should have gone for the sure out, but I know where she's thinking as she's trying to limit the number of base runners in, in scoring position. One run in the inning. Double, single, single. And the Raby goes to cut Soyanopoulos in the frame. And Ken Erickson coming out for a chat. This may be a teaching moment conversation. And I think he's trying to slow down Tennessee. They've come out with back-to-back and back hits. So trying to slow down the game, keep their momentum from keep going on and getting multiple hits. Destiny Rodriguez scheduled up next. First and third, one out. And regardless of how this game ends tonight, I, I think there are still a lot of positives you can take away on both sides, but particularly for South Florida, who's the one down four right now. Yeah, South Florida is nothing to hang their heads on tonight. They've done a great job playing defense. They just need to work on their offense because you're never going to win a game scoring zero ones and only having one hit. Antoinette Hill will spin it. Destiny Rodriguez living the dream. We talked about it earlier. Wanted to be in the starting lineup for a power five school. Here she is, steps in 0 for 2, looking for her first hit of the night. Drop ball in for a strike and a throw down to second. Caught by Garcia Soto. It's a rundown. Cadlub applies the tag, but a run comes home for Tennessee, and the lead expands to five. I would say that's not the smartest play, trying to get the runner out. out. They, I mean, I guess at this point they do need outs, but they ultimately gave up a run, and now they, they have a five to nothing lead. 
Cut Soyanopoulos crosses. Garcia Soto gets it to Cadlub. So unconventional how you get the outs, but outs are outs for South Florida right now. And I think that's what they were thinking at this point is they need outs. They'll give up the run to try to get out of this inning and limit their damage. I would have just given them second base personally and not have the run score. What I'm hearing is personally you wouldn't let that slide. <laughs> <laughs> Correct. <laughs> to be fair, you also have about significantly more years of experience. You were an ace pitcher in the pro league, so. I do have that going for me, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Two one. This is chopped left side of the infield and skips away from Galligani. E6 puts Destiny Rodriguez on board. And not a well-played ball by Galligani. She tries to backhand it on the short hop, and she should have just stayed in front of it and just doesn't do a good job in just stopping the ball. She's trying to get it on the downside and doesn't get in front of it, and that's why the ball goes past her. Well, Ole action is short. Puts a runner on for Tennessee with two gone. All in, slaps the first pitch. High chopper, swag to first, not in time. Well, infield single action for Amanda Allen. It's a multi-hit night for number 88. In, this, in the sixth inning, it's kind of unfolded for South Florida tonight with all these hits. Then you compound it with an error and just not really having basic softballs going on. Amanda Allen, she's quick on those base paths when she gets moving. Had a triple in her debut, unloaded the bases. So while Tennessee has a chance to talk about it and make some switches, tell you about men's basketball return to the Yingling Center tomorrow to take on SMU, tip off set for seven o'clock. It'll be salute to service night. There will be commemorative coin giveaways. So a tribute to the former USF Bull, Chucky Atkins. Again, that's tomorrow at 7 p.m. You can watch it here on ESPN+. Plus. Men's basketball went on the road, beat UCF the other day in what could be the final meeting of the War on I-4, at least as conference mates, as the Bulls will make a pitching change. This is Morgan Grubb taking some warm-up tosses. One of three freshmen Coach Erickson's excited about. You know, just to kind of finish the thought here, so Joey Knight put out this article the other day. He writes for the Tampa Bay Times that we, we touched on baseball. We touched on men's basketball beating UCF. Women's basketball and softball also both won that night. Do you know when the last time was that happened? I have no idea. 2011. It's only the third time it's ever happened. 1997 was the other year. Wow. That's your trivia fact for the night. <laughs> so if anybody comes asking you when the last time those four sports won on the same night, now you know. So Morgan Grubb will pitch here. And... More reps for a very young staff, so Antoine at Hill heads to the pin after some relief work. First pitch, swinging it out to short. That is stopped, the throw to third, slips by Zweig. An opportunity to tag onto the lead for Tennessee. And they take advantage. Coming in to score, it's Kirkpatrick for the Lady Vols. And it's just unfolded tonight. Makes a great stop, Galligani, and just isn't able to come up with the catch. And just another run comes forward for Tennessee. All in on the doorstep at third. After the bunt single she had to help turn it over. Kirkpatrick pinch running for Rodriguez in that spot. So for Morgan Grubb in this moment, a young pitcher from Bartow, Florida. It's been mostly a bullpen pitcher so far. 1-0 comes inside, skips away to the backstop. This will bring in another run for Tennessee. And they're up by seven here in the sixth. And you just cannot make these mistakes when you're playing a team like Tennessee, they're always going to capitalize and they're going to be aggressive like that play where Galligani stops the ball, throws it. They're going to be aggressive and take that extra base. They're going to see how many runs they can score. 
And when you come in as a pitcher like Grubb, you need to stop the damage and you cannot throw wild pitches to allow more damage to happen. Two out of Malloy. In first strike, two and one. So what does Morgan Grubb throw? You're going to see Morgan Grubb throw a lot of rise, curve, change, and drop. And that's what she's kind of been throwing right now is a lot of her curve, and she needs to throw the down ball. Maybe her defense can back her up this time around. Infield's back on Malloy. Malloy takes upstairs. Bit of a bobble behind the dish by Humplick. It's three and one. Donahue advancing on a passed ball, by the way. So that is not a wild pitch to bring in the run, but a passed ball. And outside for ball four. Malloy almost got hit by the routine throw back to the circle and cornered with two gone. So for South Florida, they're playing to get to the seventh now because if that run at third scores, the Bulls suddenly are down to their final three outs in the home sixth. Yeah, the wheels have kind of fallen off in this inning, just allowing all these hits, errors, pass ball. It's just not the same South Florida team we saw the first five innings. Well, Gabriella Nori, she was a standout tonight for South Florida. But these are the growing pains of having a young staff. Right runner takes off from first. They're going to let Malloy go into second. Try to bait a double steal. So Kiki Malloy stays perfect on the year stealing. She's five for five. SEC's active stolen base leader. She can fly on those base paths. Wave and a miss on 01. Finished the season last year as the SEC's career leader. Tied eighth in program history. You know, if you hear the name Malloy and it kind of scratches something in your brain. She is the daughter of Lawyer Malloy, the All-American in Washington, 15-year NFL vet, four-time pro bowler. Patriots, Bills, Falcons, Seahawks fans would know him. Mom also was an athlete. She ran track at Washington, so that's where she gets the speed, probably from Lawyer as well. Both sisters also play in softball, so very athletic family, and it's shown tonight. This is pounded down the left field line, and that is foul just wide of the pole. That was really close. It cleared over that foul pole. And these, and these Tennessee hitters have really come to, to bat this time. That shaves the outer edge of the foul pole. That is about, what, about a foot and a half away from being fair? Way outside on 1-2 from Grubb. And just to give Nori some credit on how well she did, she really kept these Tennessee hitters off balance and limited them to, to two hits through the five innings. And it just shows you when you can place the ball and keep a hitters off balance and change the eye level, you're going to be successful against a lot of teams and a lot of tough teams. Slapped foul. Well, Tennessee has now set nine. Gibson, if she gets on, Tennessee would have batted around. Wheels have come off for South Florida. It was scoreless through four, three in the fifth, now four in the sixth. This is what good teams do. They remain patient, and then they pounce on you. And the Lady Vols are just that. Chopped foul into the netting. And just going back to what you talked about, they're also, South Florida right now needs to get this last out because if Tennessee scores, they now have an eight-run rule. And that's the last thing you want as a team is to be eight run rolled, regardless of who it's by. Just getting to the seventh inning and playing the complete game, that seems goal number one for South Florida. They got two more games this week. 2-2 two -two on the ground, a short diving attempt in, gets away from Galligani. Donahue is in, Malloy right behind her, and the balls are into run rule territory, nine nothing over South Florida. And Gibson is just able to find a hole. They're just 
putting the ball in place and putting the ball in place well. And it's nothing spectacular. She just finds the hole up the middle. And that's what you do as a solid hitter. You find a, you just find a spot to put it. Two ribbies for Gibson. I think a 12 on the young year for number 24. And Zeta Pune, we say hello again to her. She had a double to kickstart this inning. Tennessee in this frame has put that power and that hitting and that on-base percentage on display. Four runs on six hits in air. I mean, this has been lopsided here in the sixth. And Pooney stands in high and away for ball one. So you look ahead for Tennessee tomorrow. They're going to play Clemson. Top 10 matchup. Again, that's here on ESPN Plus, 11.30 a.m. That's going to be a good game. That's going to be a really exciting game. You got ACC, SEC. Two different color oranges. It is a rematch, if you watch college football, of the Orange Bowl. Maybe the most appropriately named bowl of this past bowl season. <laughs> South Florida is going to play Texas later this year. They are slowly gathering just every orange team across this great land. Ken Erickson bringing in some of the top teams from around the country. Doesn't have to leave the state of Florida. Part of a 28-game homestand for the Bulls. How many orange teams are there even left at that point? Because you've gotten Tennessee, Clemson, and Texas. Syracuse would be one. Auburn would be another. It's orange and navy. What's the Ivy League school that I'm thinking Princeton? of? Princeton. Princeton and Illinois. Those are two more. They will play, if I'm not mistaken, Illinois later this year. Although it's crossover season, so don't quote me on that. They do. March 10th and March 11th. Take a look at some of the national storylines. We talked about the frame of no-hitter earlier. Kentucky over the Mary Nutter knocked off Washington. Speaking of Clemson, they're the only unbeaten ACC team right now. So that will be put to the test tomorrow morning. And this was the big news the other day. Monica Abbott, former Tennessee legend, announces her retirement. I mean, an icon of the game, right? Yes, icon. I mean, she. so many girls looked up to her. I looked up to her. The way she could throw a ball. Fly ball, right field. Hit pretty well. Hanlon encircles it. She's got it. And this inning comes to a close. Tennessee bringing the bat. South Florida's got to score two to keep the game going. A decade of power performance. and a vision for a powerful future. This is the American Athletic Conference. Everyone gets a BK stacker. Tiny dancer. Two linebackers. To each their own. Burger, swagger, satisfaction, buffet. BK. Have it your way. Bravo. You use the Quicksilver card from Capital One with no annual fee and unlimited 1.5% cash back on every purchase every way. That makes you the hero of every purchase. Ah! What's in your wallet? Got Scholes has eyes on a complete game of one hitter. Tennessee 9, South Florida nothing. Run rule territory as we go to the home six. Got Scholes got the Bulls number tonight. Allison and Boy, this has been fun to watch from 33. Yeah, Gotcha has been on fire. I'm a big fan of high strikeout games and seeing her get in her groove, really mix up the pitches, curve, rise, keeping them off balance on their eye level zones and changing that level so the South Florida hitters are off balance. For South Florida in this inning, Garcia Soto leads off 8, 9, and 1 for the Green and Golds. They need two to keep the game going to the seventh. And the first pitch to Garcia Soto hits her on the shoulder. Big clap to try and fire him up. Lead off base runner for the Bulls. 
take it any way you'll get it because they haven't had much luck putting the ball in play, so get a hit that way. Jordan Cadlob, right hand hitter. Squares to bunt, pops it up into an awkward spot, but Gibson's got it. One out in the inning. And Cadlob needed to put that ball down in play, not in the air, to get Garcia Soto moved to second. That was Ken Erickson's whole plan into sacrificing Cadlob. Trying to small ball with the best of them. Emily Hanlon, 0 for 2 tonight, has not struck out though. Fly ball, air to center field, and that's easy. Tennessee's got two down against South Florida. Malloy makes the squeeze. First pitch from Bryant, slashes through it. And right now, Bryant has to get a hit, otherwise the inning is over. They have two outs with a runner on. She is their last hope to keep South Florida going at this point. Bryant flies it to left center, dropping fast, and it's the shortstop, Donahue, who grabs it, and that'll do it. Tennessee run rules, South Florida 9-0, your final score. Scoreless through four, but an onslaught of offense in the fifth of the sixth. And Gatso is just absolutely lights out with the strikeouts tonight, keeping her curveball and rise ball out of the zone, and just South Florida unable to capitalize on it, only giving up or only allowing one hit through her her six innings. So Rocky Top takes it 9-0, and now they've got the Clemson Tigers tomorrow morning. We'll have that for you here on ESPN Plus, 11.30, first pitch. For our producer, Tom Piero, director Drew Vincent, my partner Allison Keim, and our entire crew, so 